All right, gang, in this video, I want to talk about private and sensitive data and how to handle it, right? So privacy is important to me and you, and it's super important to organizations, right? Pretty much we expect for a secret to stay a secret. Okay, when privacy is breached, it can be really bad for organization, right? So that's what we're gonna focus on, privacy when it's talking about an organization, because you guys are gonna be working for um, a company or organization, so you're probably gonna have to deal with this stuff more often than not. So if a breach, well, you shouldn't have to deal with it too much if uh, you're on top of your game, because stuff shouldn't be getting breached, but some stuff is just, you know, unavoidable. Anyway, breach, right? So a breach can really, really, really affect the organization and the company, in a few different ways. One of the worst ways it can actually affect the company is damaging their reputation, right? So if a breach happens, a lot of times the public won't trust them anymore, right? It's so, okay, they got a breach, they must not take security seriously, they can you know, have my passwords, my data, everything all out uh, on the internet willy-nilly, and that's no bueno. With that information being out there in the public, another really bad thing can be identity theft. So not only is your reputation damaged, the customers that trusted you, the people that trusted you, now their private information has been made public. And that could lead to things like identity theft. Now, if you don't know, identity theft is on the rise and a person only needs a few different um, pieces of vital information from you or about you to get your identity and to take out bank loans, uh, to commit crimes in your name, all kind of stuff. So now you're working at a company, the reputation is damaged, and the customers that trusted you and your company, their damn identities got stolen. So when you are working at an organization and a breach happens, it is imperative, it is imperative to react super fast, right then, and you need to disclose the breach to the proper people. If it's the customers, if it's the higher ups, whoever it affected, you need to disclose that information and put in place, whether it's to update passwords, whether it's to log everybody out, whatever it is, you have to jump on that breach really, really soon, right? And a lot of times, you know, a breach can be embarrassing, right? If you're a cybersecurity company and you got hacked, it's gonna be kind of, it's gonna look kind of bad if um, you don't, uh, or if you actually do get um, breached, right? All right, so when breaches happen, when you get to become a CSO, when you get to become a cybersecurity engineer, make sure that you handle it as quickly as possible and disclose the information. So a lot of times a breach can be really embarrassing for a company, right? So some companies have went as far as just not saying anything and just trying to sweep it under the rug and hoping that nobody noticed, right? But that can come back to bite you. That can come back to bite you. Um, in fact, Uber, you know, Uber, you call somebody, a stranger come picks you up, Uber, right? So in 2016, Uber actually was hacked and about 50 something million people's account information was made public. Now they tried to keep it under wraps, but it ended up coming out in 2017 and they tried to disclose it like, hey, yeah, this did happen. Hey, we changed people's passwords. We put in these safe uh, safety measures but the damage had already been done. So it's always better just to come clean and say, hey man, we messed up, this is what happened and this is what we plan to do to fix it and this is what we have in place now so it doesn't happen again. When a breach happens, hackers have access to all kinds of data, right? So let's go through the different types of data. So we got public data, which is public. Everybody knows this stuff. Then we got personal data, only you should know and the people that you've given explicit access to should know those personal things about you. So one of those other classifications is sensitive. So sensitive data would be stuff such as PII or personal identifiable information. So PII is things that can identify you, right? And a lot of times if a hacker gets enough PII information about you, they can steal your identity or they can actually do things on your behalf. So examples of PII would be your address, your name, and your social security number. So with those three things, you can actually do a lot more than you would think, right? So PII is usually a combination of a couple different things that's gonna identify you. So if somebody wanted to hack uh, your account, if somebody wanted to steal your identity, they will want 
the PII. So basically, PII in a nutshell is things that identify you personally, right? And for a hacker to be successful, the PII they would need would basically be, let's see, would be like the security questions um, if you locked out your account, right? So it may be simple stuff. What high school did you go to? What was your first job? What car do you drive? Make sense? All right, so PII will be listed under sensitive data. So the next classification is going to be confidential. So sensitive and confidential data can actually kind of get mixed up sometimes, right? So this is the most major difference. PII possibly can be damaging to an organization or to a person if it's made public. Confidential information will be damaging to an organization or person if, you may, if it's made public. Make sense? So confidential stuff is for sure, for sure, only these people, only these entities, only this organization should know about this data. So sensitive stuff, maybe it jacks some stuff up. Confidential, for sure, jacks some stuff up. So confidential stuff is, more, is supposed to be secret. It's supposed to be on a need to know basis. It's supposed to be, okay, only these people and any of these personnel and this organization is supposed to know about this stuff. If this is made public or if other people know about this, then it's gonna cause harm to these individuals and to this organization. For example, I got some confidential information for y'all. Me, myself, for years, I'm talking about years and years and years and years, used to pronounce salmon, salmon, right? I used to say, hey, can I get some salmon, right? You know, the L is supposed to be silent, but not for me, it wasn't silent. So that was confidential information. It's embarrassing a little bit, but that's confidential information for me. That's a joke. Please don't take that seriously. But if I gave a damn, that would be damaging if a bunch of other people knew about it. Makes sense? So, uh, and a bunch of people did uh, know about it maybe until somebody finally, <laughs> somebody finally uh, tapped me on the shoulder like, hey man, you know the L is silent. I'm like what? And it's a funny thing. It didn't come up that much because I don't even eat fish. All right, the last piece is gonna be health. So health information, is vital and it needs to be kept private and only people doctors nurses and other people that need access to that information should be the only people that have access to that information hipaa uh, which we all are familiar with are laws and regulations that say hey this is how health information this is how health data needs to be stored if it's not stored this way these are the fines and these are the things that can happen and it's you know it's fines up to millions of dollars and even jail time that people can face for not handling health data the way they should. Unfortunately, um, it's all too common that um, health data is exposed to the wrong people um, and, you know, maybe some files are left in the garbage can, so on and so forth. So it's up to you guys. Like I said, when you get inside of a security position that you make sure that you do what you need to do to make sure that people's data is kept safe at all times. One way to keep private data private is data minimization. So data minimization is a process where you only collect the information and the data that you absolutely need and nothing else. That way you can kind of lower the attack surface for somebody, all right? So somebody won't have somebody's whole catalog, won't have somebody's information from top to bottom. They'll only have the stuff that you need explicitly, nothing extra. So data minimization, let's just get the stuff that we need for this person to function and be in our system. Let's just get the information that we need. So if somebody does hack, this information, if somebody does get this information, they don't have absolutely everything from the time this person was born until the present day. Another way to help with keeping private data private is data masking. So this is a different way to do things. So you input information, the private information into your system, into your database. But when people actually see it to the public or if somebody that's not supposed to be in the system gets in the system, what's supposed to happen is that Instead of the information popping up, symbols or characters will pop up, right? For example, you know, if you put your uh, bank information, if you save your credit card information to a website, usually there's a bunch of asterisks and then maybe the last four of your uh, credit card will show up, right? So that would be considered data masking, right? So we don't have to show the entire credit card. So somebody looking over your shoulder, they can just jot it down and then go on Amazon and have a damn ball, right? So data masking just actually masks whatever data that we don't wanna be made public. So last but not least is data tokenization. 
So data tokenization is somewhat similar to data masking, but it takes it a step further. So instead of just masking the data, we actually replace the real data with fake data or tokens, okay? So if your credit card number or your social security number is stored inside of a system, your uh, social security number may be 832-241747, but in the actual system, it's gonna come up as 12345678 Makes sense? So we just change, or it might just be all zeros, or it might be all ones, but it's gonna replace your real data with random strings of data. So instead of masking it, something is gonna show up, but it won't be your actual data. It's gonna be a random string of data. So data tokenization, data masking, data masking, let's just hide this stuff. Data tokens or tokenization, let's completely change this stuff around. Although the data is the same, looking from the outside looking in, it looks completely different. So talking about all this data, who's responsible for this data? Let's go through the different roles and responsibility of people that deal with data. So the first thing we'll talk about is the data owner. The data owner, simply put, is usually a person in a high position and they take responsibility for that data segment and that data. So next up is a data controller. A data controller can be one person or organization and they're in control of when and how data is to be processed. Next up is an actual data processor. Once again, this can be an individual or organization. After the data controller says, hey, this is the procedure we're going to use to process this data, the data processor uses those procedures to process that data. Next up, we got a data custodian. So a data custodian is responsible for the storage and transport of the data. The custodian makes sure that the integrity, security of the actual data stays intact the entire time it's in their custody. Last but not least is a DPO or a data protection officer. So a DPO is responsible for making sure that an organization or a company has a good data security and protection strategy, right? If their strategy is, man, we're just gonna leave these flash drives and these hard drives in the bathroom, or we're just gonna leave the damn server room open whenever people can have access to whatever they want, the DPO is probably gonna cuss them the hell out and tell them, hey man, that's not a good idea. All right, so the DPO is just pretty much the person that comes with the strategy and just to make sure that a company or organization has things in place to make sure that the data is always protected. Now, believe it or not, out of all those roles, in some cases or in most cases, one person may fill one or multiple roles when it comes to data protection and data safety. So today we talked about private and sensitive data and how to protect it. And this is going to be a super big part or a huge part of your cybersecurity journey, uh, trying to make sure that people's data is kept safe. So after this, make sure that you finish up the small tests and then get ready for the next lecture, which is pretty much going to be the pre-exam lecture, right? So it's going to be our last time rocking out. Then you're going to take the pre-test. Then you're going to take the final exam. Then you're going to take the real certification. All right. So that's it. That's all. And other than that, I'll see you when you get certified.